I know you're here to hear about robot dinosaurs, but I really want to tell you about what I did in my summer holidays. Now, it's about that time of year. Who actually dreads that phrase? Who takes them straight back to school and thinking, oh my goodness, I have got to fill two pages with what I did in my summer holidays. Yeah, anyone else got that dread coming on? I did. My friends would go abroad. They'd go to Disney World. They'd come to Hebden Bridge. They'd be able to fill those two pages. I'd spend my time probably climbing trees and whittling sticks and had a whale of a time over the summer, but could only fill two lines. Until August 1980. I was 10 years old, and for my summer holidays, I went to the Isle of Wight. And the Isle of Wight meant Black Gang Chine. Now, if you were a child in the 70s, you would have known about Black Gang Chine. Didn't have social media, so how did everybody know about Black Gang Chine? Well, there was one TV program that every child watched. It was called Blue Peter. If you'd watched Blue Peter, you would have seen fiberglass dinosaurs being made up in Yorkshire, being transported down the length of the country with John Noakes and Shep, coming down to the Isle of Wight and being installed on the island. Black Gang Chine is between a cliff and the sea. The dinosaurs couldn't walk in, they couldn't be trucked in, <coughs> they had to be airlifted in. Now, if you saw this as a child, <laughs> it really made a memory. This was the excitement we had in the 70s. I'm going to show that again. And if you went to Black Gang Chine, you had to get a picture like this. Put your hands up if you've got a photo like this somewhere. Yeah, four or five. I gave this talk in Austria. And I asked that question, and there was a hand at the back said, yeah, I've got that photo. It was the photo to get. Favourite dinosaur? They were, they were ferocious. They were fearsome. But this was my favourite. So when I got to school that year, I managed to fill my two pages, even before break time, and I still got to go out and play. Yes! But time progressed and the dinosaurs sort of faded from everyone's consciousness but if you still mention the fiberglass dinosaurs at Black Gang Chine it still puts a smile on people's faces. Fast forward 30 years. August 2010 and I wanted a puppy. My friends, my neighbours were having puppies. Their dog was having puppies. And the midwife was Alexander de Bell. He helped these puppies get born, and I'd go up and see them. Alexander de Bell happens to be the great great grandson of the Alexander de Bell who set up. Black Gang Chine in the early 1800s. And the, the grandson, Alexander de Bell, is an engineer. And so we got talking about all sorts of gadgets and gizmos. And I said how I'd gone to see the dinosaurs. So I went around and I saw all the, 
the dinosaurs, I went back to Black Gang Chine 30 years later and saw the fiberglass dinosaurs, the same ones that were there in the 70s. You can imagine that 30 years of weather didn't do the dinosaurs that much good. And obviously, I'm a little bit bigger now than I was then. They didn't seem quite so ferocious. They're a little bit more faded and probably on the edge of extinction. And to be quite honest, tourism in the Isle of Wight was going down as well. I mean, in the 70s, it got reboosted and the dinosaurs helped save the park because that was when all the cheap flights were starting to foreign countries and people weren't holidaying on the Isle of Wight quite so much. So the dinosaurs saved the park in the 70s, but 2010, not so much. They were, they were all looking a bit weary. But in 2012, Alexander de Bell, the great-great-grandson, took control of the park. And he realized that the dinosaurs were still an attraction, that people still like dinosaurs. Whether they're six years old, 60 years old, that child inside still loves dinosaurs. And so he got some animatronic dinosaurs and installed them in Area 5. Big fanfare, this is about Easter 2012. Big fanfare, people were coming, the whole um, atmosphere was reinvigorated, the whole park was reinvigorated. Everything was getting exciting again. Unfortunately, the T-Rex, the biggest dinosaur that they've got, the one there, you stand on a platform and when it roars, the, they've got the whole platform vibrating. Yeah, it went in a sulk. It didn't like being woken up from its coma of 30 years and it fried its electronics. The dinosaurs had come from China. The people at the park had phoned China and said, OK, we need more control electronics. They said, yeah, OK, we'll send some over. It'll take six weeks. This was two weeks before the busy six, the summer holidays when 80% of the people come to the park. And the big fanfare about the T-Rex working, well, if it wasn't, it was going to cause problems. So Raspberry Pi came to the rescue. Bagang Chine is a small park, and the staff are multidisciplinary. They will sometimes be manning the rides, sometimes doing the gardening, sometimes doing the fiberglassing, sometimes doing the technical stuff. And so no one really had responsibility for all the tech stuff. But one chap, Mark Butler, he thought, right, I've heard of a Raspberry Pi. I think the Raspberry Pi can fix the electronics in the T-Rex. So he took the Pi, never had one before, took it, locked himself in a dark room for two weeks, taught himself enough Python to get the T-Rex to struggle through the summer holidays and work all the way through amazing feat that he did there and all that was just from using the community asking people talking to people and finding out what he could on the internet so after the busy six when everyone could breathe a sigh of relief and have a bit more time Alexander de Bell gave me a call and he said we need a longer term solution I had to come up with a rescue formula to how to make sure that not just the T-Rex, but all the dinosaurs, if there was a problem, how we could fix them all and to make sure that the, the coding and what Mark had done with the Raspberry Pi was actually a sustainable solution. So my equation was happy dinosaurs. Get some makers together. And the staff, they wanted not to call expensive consultants in every time the dinosaurs were, were not working, unfortunate for me, um, but they wanted the staff to actually be trained in how to program them and do the things and fix them. So makers and the staff all gathering with co over coffee and cake and time meant that we could do this. So I put together a hack session. 
I called the makers and the hackers that I knew, and we got together with the staff. And Black Gang Chine provided coffee and cake and dinosaurs. And we had a, a bit of a hack session. The electronics experts in the group went through all the electronics. The, the control panel that had actually blown up um, or, or fried was 1980s electronics. We couldn't get to the parts anymore to refix the boards. So there was not a question of just getting more from China. It was a question of we're going to have to redesign what we're doing. And so the controller actually could be a Raspberry Pi. That wasn't the problem. And it could have sound from it. We couldn't then control the motors. We still had to use the Chinese motor board because the 16 amp motors on the dinosaurs were a bit too big just for the Pi to run off. So we had to develop some more electronics for that. And to code it, well, the staff don't necessarily have a, a technical coding background. They don't particularly want to be coders, but they want to be able to control these dinosaurs. And so I started teaching them how to use the Raspberry Pi, how to get an LED to flash, and using Node-RED. So I will just go through with you how simple Node-RED is. Has anyone here, let's do, let's go on to the live stuff. Anyone here used Node-RED before? Okay, quite a few, bear with me when I go wrong. <laughs> anyone here not heard of Node-RED before? Okay, Node-RED is a visual drag and drop programming language. It was developed by uh, some people at IBM who were finding that they were using the same libraries time and time again and didn't really want to just call the library, grab the text. They'd rather just drag a block that was already, they knew what it would do and put that in. So they developed it for their own use, put it out, it's open source, and now if you've got a Raspberry Pi and you've got the most up-to-date um, Jesse operating system, Node-RED already comes as part of that system. So it's on, if you, if you look on a Raspberry Pi under programming, there's Node-RED, it's already there. So it's available, it's free, the park weren't gonna have to buy anything. So I'm just going to demonstrate what I've got here. I've got an inject node from this side. I move it over there and it turns to the word timestamp. I take a debug mode node, put it there. If I click over here, I can see the debug. I join them together. I deploy. And there on the left hand so right hand side is the timestamp. I can easily change that timestamp to a string. Deploy it, press the inject node, and there's my first hello world. So it's very, very simple to get your first hello world programming up. Going on from that, I've put on the Raspberry Pi, some traffic lights. So down at the front there, there's some traffic lights. And I'm scrolling down for a Raspberry Pi GPIO pin. I'm going to put that down there. And I know that the red pin is pin 35. I'm going to give it a name. So now I've just said I've labelled one of my GPIO general purpose input output pins on, on the Raspberry Pi, and I've labelled that pin 35 there. I go back up to my inject node. Now, the GPIOs need a 1 or a naught, so I'm going to change that back to a string and put a 1, connect them two together, connect the two together, and hopefully down on the table, my red... LED has come on. Oops, I'll put another one. So I want to be able to turn it off. OK, 
connect that. So on and off. So this was the first bit of coding that many of the staff had done and the first bit of hardware use that actually some of the programmers had done. So they were getting quite excited about this, but we wanted to move on from the LEDs. This is an open collector driver. Uh, it's effectively a relay, a switch, and it allows the uh, low voltage on the Raspberry Pi to switch something of a higher voltage. So I can use this to um, t turn motors on and off, which you couldn't do. You can't put a, even a 1.5 volt motor, you can't put straight onto the GPIO pins because there's too much uh, current going through and it would fry it. So you need some other kind of switch. So this is just a, a logic switch that will allow a higher voltage to be turned on and off. And I've called these my thingatrons because I can connect things to the internet with it. And I was making so many that I made the PCB up. So you can see here, this is my little dyno. I've got my dyno at the front. I've got a thingatron connected in and it's connected to the Raspberry Pi. Go back to the coding. So I've put that on the GPIO pin 26. So I'll put that down there. I'll tell it I'm talking to number 26. That little dyno is called Wake Dyno. I'll connect it to the on and the off. I'll deploy. on and off. So by this stage, everyone was getting really quite excited that we're actually being able to control something just from a bit of software, actually some real life hardware. My, um, I'm connected over the internet to the Raspberry Pi, so everything that I'm doing is not on my laptop, it's actually on this Raspberry Pi. All the programming is on that Raspberry Pi. <coughs> I'm just talking to it through the web browser on here. But what if I didn't want to connect through with a computer? Well, I can add a Twitter feed. And if I look for Wake Dino, if someone wants to get their phone out and start tweeting, if I connect up, oh, actually, what I've just done there, I've so this will give an output of whatever you tweet. Well, I don't want it, um, it, I said it needs a one or a naught to actually turn it on. So I need to change whatever you say. Change that to a one. So I've just put a change node in there. I'm gonna move things out a bit. So if someone tweets, it'll come through to the change and it'll wake up the dinosaur. But because I don't want to turn it off, I'll put a little delay in here. Uh, let's start tidying things up a bit. So after five seconds, I want to change it. Let me take those off. Okay, so hopefully you can now see. So if someone tweets Wake Dino, it'll be changed to a one and turn the dino on. After a delay of five seconds, that same tweet 
will change to a zero and turn my dyno off. I'm going to put that on there as well. So deploy. I'm going to put a debug on there as well, just in case, so I can see what's happening. OK, can someone put their hand up if they've tweeted? No one's tweeting. Oh, yeah. Yay! So someone's tweeted, having fun with robotic dinosaurs at Wuthering Bites, and someone else tweeted, hello, and the dinosaur's woken up. So I can now completely disconnect my laptop from this, and as long as the Pi's got power connected to the dyno, whenever anyone tweets, hashtag wake dyno, dyno will wake up and start nodding. So some of the staff were thinking, hey, I can put this in the kids' bedroom and actually have it upstairs, and when it's dinner time, I can just do wake dyno and it'll start nodding. But, you know, a little toy dinosaur is, well, a little toy dinosaur. I wanted to play with the big dinosaurs in the park. So they gave me a little dinosaur. <laughs> this is Dee Dee, the desktop dinosaur. And she would actually work with all the thingatrons um, to make her work, and she does exactly what the bigger dinosaurs or some of the dinosaurs in the park do. So she'll wag her tail, she'll open her mouth and she'll bounce her body up and down. Um, in order to actually use whatever I do here on the big main dinosaurs, we had to develop some more electronics and uh, James McFarlane from Airborne Engineering has actually developed a whole set of touch bridge system that will allow, and it's now in all the dinosaurs on the park, that will allow the Raspberry Pis to control motors. Oh, I'm going to just go back to some node red here. So this is on another Pi, but I've got the tail working, on and off, the jaws work. And the, the jaws have got a sensor, so they know when they're open or closed, so it'll just do one up and down. And the body. Body, tail, and jaws all at the same time. Now, if I put this one here, So you can always get, also get them to, to talk. So I've also now got a Twitter feed already set up here with Wuthering Bytes. Uh, connected on. Deploy. So if anyone tweets or if anyone tweets Wuthering Bytes, hopefully she'll roar. And yes, Dee Dee is female. If you saw the clip on Robot Wars, you'll understand that. Ah, my Twitter rate has been hit. Sorry. Um, but I can force it. And I can also make it say anything I want. So you now actually have control of DD with um, these hashtags. If you tweet any of those hashtags, DD will start moving around. Um, I'm just going to disconnect the speaker because I'm going to play a video, and I don't trust any of you. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So this is a video taken of that first hack session that I did at Black Gang Chine. Um, we got the staff together, we got some makers and hackers together, and we actually had someone, Andy Sanford Clark from IBM, who was at that first hack session, and the staff were saying, but we want, when you walk past the motion sensor, we want it to do something different every time, just like rolling a dice, we want it to be random, we don't want it to every time do the same thing. So over that weekend, Andy was texting and tweeting to uh, Dave Conway-Jones from IBM, and together they put together a random node, which, uh, if I can do this, No, oh, I've lost it. It's somewhere on there. There it is. There's a random node. It's now part of the general build. Because the staff wanted it at Black Gang, it was all taken open source, and now it's there for anyone to use. So here's the video of that first event.
Raspberry Pi and Node Red really rescued the dinosaurs at Black Gang Chine, but the dinosaurs from Black Gang Chine helped Raspberry Pi and Node Red get onto BBC Robot Wars. So I think it's as the whole of the uh, maker community, it's a win-win all round. That concludes my talk. Thank you. <laughs>